So with this lecture, we're going to switch gears a little bit and move beyond some of the initial design phases and literature review things we've been talking about and start to apply some of the concepts that may be a little bit more familiar from STAT 261. That is, we're going to start looking at the data side and analysis of things. Now, the first thing we need in order to do that is to get a handle on what type of data we have. And to lay the foundation for that, this lecture is going to discuss different types of distributions. Some of this material is relevant from Chapter 5, especially the beginning and end of Chapter 5. Check on NECA for the exact page numbers from Chapter 5 and the material that will be relevant for this lecture. Now, when we're displaying data, which is what we're doing when we look at different types of distributions, there's really two different strategies we can take. The first is to display an entire data set. Now, what this means is that every single score, every single value, every single data point or observation that we collect is going to show up in our display of data. This is useful for illustrating global patterns and trends in the data. We can see whether a lot of people scored very high, whether a lot of people scored very low, and as we'll see, it really gives us a sense of where to look further for some of the effects in our data. Again, the key here is that every single observation is represented, and thereby we can get a sense of what the entire data set looks like, rather than just any sort of summary measures. However, summary measures are also useful. Those aren't what we're going to be talking about in this lecture. We'll get to those as we come across them. But summary measures are also important for looking at, for example, what is the average or mean score in a data set? How much variability is there? And if, say, we want to compare across two or three different groups, it may not be useful to look at a plot of every single data point from every single one of those groups. We might just be interested in plotting, for example, the means of two or three different groups all in one graph. So again, these are the two sort of general categories of, of data displays we can talk about. What we're going to look at today are the first type, displays of entire sets of data. And that all starts with looking at visualizing just one variable. So what we're going to do is to, to build up a representation. And you can think of it this way. Let's say that we have some dependent variable, which is shown on the x-axis here. Okay, and it ranges from 0 to whatever we're going to measure, 30, 50, 100, whatever the case may be. Now what you can imagine is that let's say somebody scores a 10 on our dependent variable. Well, you can think about just dropping a point down, literally, onto this axis of that person who scored a 10. And if somebody else scores an 11, you can imagine just dropping a point down for them as well. If somebody scores a 12, again, you're just going to drop a point down onto this x-axis for each individual person and whatever score they achieve. And as we do that for individual people, as we collect more and more data, you can imagine, again, just dropping each of these points down depending on what these different scores are. Okay? Some people are scoring 9s, 8s, 7s, 6s, 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s. Somebody's way out there at about 20 or 25. Okay? And as we continue to do this, each individual score that we collect on whatever scale or measure it is we're taking, okay? and regardless of the data type here, usually as well, and then you can think about sort of starting to build up this distribution that shows each and every individual score. So once we collect data over a lot of people, we might build up something that looks like this. Okay, now this is exactly what we refer to as a frequency distribution. Okay, a frequency distribution represents each and every individual score in this sort of a format with the value or score on the dependent variable on our x-axis. And notice on the y-axis then, we have n listed there. In other words, this is just the count or the number of people who have obtained each score. If you look again above the number 10, you can see there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 different points that are shown above the value 10 there. Well, that means that we know that 9 people scored a 10 on our dependent variable. Okay? Apparently, 8 people scored an 11. 13 people scored a 12, and so forth and so on. So by looking at how many points lie above each individual score, we know how many people then obtained that value for our dependent variable. Again, this display of every single value on one variable in a study is what we refer to as a frequency distribution. Now this is a great way, again, to just get a general sense of what our data looks like. Okay, we see that there's a few people who scored way out there up at the top. We refer to those people as outliers. And only by looking at a, a visualization that shows us each and every score, such as a frequency distribution, are we able to see these types of outliers so apparently. Now, when you look at this frequency distribution, you can see that there's ups and downs in the shape of the distribution. Okay? In other words, if you look at above a score of about 12, 
Right? As we mentioned before, there's 13 people. And then it goes down to, what do we have? Nine people who've scored 13, eight people who've scored 14, and then it drops all the way down to four people who've scored a 15, and then it jumps back up to nine people. Okay, so in other words, you can see there's this sort of dip there in the distribution. Now, is that meaningful? Maybe, maybe not. It could just be that there's not really that big of a difference between a score of, say, 15 and 16 on our dependent variable, but it's just sort of chance factors that have led to a little dip down to just four people who've scored a 15 on our specific value. Well, one thing we can do is to take a frequency distribution and essentially decrease the resolution or try and smooth it out a little bit and get rid of some of these sort of idiosyncratic peaks and valleys. So imagine that what we're going to do is this. Instead of showing the people who've scored each individual score, as we're showing here in our frequency distribution, let's say that we just stack them up or do what we're going to call binning our values. In other words, let's create a bin of not just people that have scored six, but let's put six and seven together, okay? or five and six together, seven and eight together. Take the people who scored nine, put those on top of the people that scored 10, and so forth and so on. Now you can see that our x-axis has changed. And instead of showing just the people who scored 10, what we have now are the people who've scored nine or 10. Okay, we've created a bin or a category of people that have scored some range of values on our dependent variable. Now on our, our y-axis is still n or the count, the number of people that belong to that category or that grouping or that bin, okay, the people that have provided that range of values. In this case now we see how many people have scored either 9 or 10, 11 or 12. And what you may also notice is relative to the raw frequency distribution, in this situation now, too, you can see there's a little bit more continuity or smoothness in the shape of this distribution. In other words, the distribution comes to a peak at a score of 11 or 12, and then it goes down pretty systematically after that. Relatively fewer people then have a score of 13 or 14, and then even fewer have 15 or 16 or so forth and so on. So compared to the raw frequency distribution shown here, where again you see all these peaks and valleys that are sort of uncharacteristic of a general trend in the data. If we stack it back up into the histogram that we saw before, then again what it does is help to smooth it out a little bit. So when we look at this, once we create these bins and stack up multiple values in, in, in each column here, in each category, again this is what we refer to as a histogram as opposed to the raw frequency distribution. Now this type of display can be especially useful for data such as reaction times. Think about that for a minute. Now people might respond in some task and maybe somebody responds after 520 milliseconds. That's a little bit over half a second. Well in a raw frequency distribution chances are there's not going to be any two people who produce the exact same value down to the millisecond. Maybe you have somebody else who responds after 525 milliseconds. Somebody else after 531 milliseconds. When you think about it, we're talking about a difference of five or ten thousandths of a second here between these three different people. So it doesn't make sense to show them as adjacent points on a raw frequency distribution. It makes a lot more sense to bin our reaction time data, such as 500 to 600 milliseconds, 600 to 700 milliseconds, and so forth and so on. So especially for high resolution continuous data, it does make sense a lot of times to look at a histogram of the data instead. More often you'll see a histogram that looks something like this using bars to represent um, the, the heights of the different categories or the counts here. Now be careful, again this is called a histogram. There's a little bit of a distinction between the way we're using uh, this display here and our labels and what Jackson's looking for in chapter 5. So pay careful attention there. Now the next thing to think about hopefully we all get a good sense of what a frequency distribution is and what it looks like. Now another important thing to keep in mind is rather than showing all of these individual little dots every time we talk about a specific distribution in this class, okay, a lot of times what we'll do is just think about a more stylized representation such as this, okay, sort of an outline of the distribution. Okay. Now the next important thing that to consider is classifying different types of distributions. In particular we want to look at distributions of different shapes. Okay, this is what we would call a normal distribution, and I'm sure you guys probably all know this by now. Okay, it's also referred to as a Gaussian or bell-shaped or whatever. Normal distribution is probably the most common name, and the name we'll refer to this in this course. Okay, it peaks at the center, 
and then it falls off gently as you can see to both sides and also at a decreasing rate. In other words, the further and further you get away from the center of the, of the distribution, the more quickly the frequency or number of scores that are represented by those values um, get smaller and smaller or approach zero. Now if we take one of the tails of this distri normal distribution and stretch it out a little bit, in other words, the scores still might be kind of bunched up in one area, but then if there's relatively few scores that are either very high, such as in this case, okay, or very low, such as in this case here, those are both examples of what we would call a skewed distribution. Now we make a further distinction between whether the distribution is positively skewed, which is this example here, where the tail is stretched out to the upper scores. Okay, So the higher valued scores are the ones that occur relatively infrequently. And a negatively skewed distribution, shown here, where it's the lower valued scores that are showing up relatively infrequently, and most of the scores are bunched up near the top of our scale in this case. Okay, both of these are called skewed distributions. The distinction is to whether they are positively or negatively skewed. Another type of distribution is one where there's not a single peak, as in the normal and skewed distributions, but this situation where there might be two different scores that are occurring relatively frequently and the other scores not so much. This is what we call a bimodal distribution. Okay? As we'll see very soon, and you probably recall from Stats 261, the mode is the most frequently occurring score in a distribution. Therefore, as the name bimodal suggests, there are two modes or two very frequently occurring scores in this type of distribution. Now one thing to point out is these two scores don't have to occur equally frequently. We can also have a bimodal distribution that looks something like this, okay, where one score occurs very frequently okay, and the other score occurs still much more frequently than most of the others but not as much as the first. This would still be classified as a bimodal distribution. But this raises another distinction in terms of the types of graphs or distributions we're going to see. Okay, and that is looking at distributional symmetry. Okay, now we all know what the word symmetric or symmetry means, and in this case it's nothing different. This would be an example of an asymmetric distribution. Okay, that is, if you look at it reflected across the center, it looks different on the left side and the right side. That's because one peak here is higher than the other. But if we look at this other type of bimodal distribution, this would be an example of a symmetric bimodal distribution. Because again, if we look at sort of splitting this right down the middle, the left side looks just like the right side. Okay? It's reflected across the center of the distribution and would therefore be a symmetric bimodal distribution. Now one thing to ask yourself maybe is to take a break and see if you understand the notion of symmetry. Is a normal distribution a symmetric distribution? And in fact it is. Okay? If you recall what a normal distribution looks like, it peaks in the center and then falls off gradually and equally on both sides. What about a skewed distribution? Is that a symmetric distribution? No, it's not. By definition, a skewed distribution has one of its tails pulled out to one side or the other relative to a normal distribution. And therefore, if you think about what a skewed distribution looks like, it's not reflected across its center. Okay? So you can think about symmetry as another characteristic of these distributions. One final distribution shape is in this situation here. Look, all of these scores are occurring relatively equally frequently. In other words, they're showing up about the same number of times. Okay? Now again, what we're going to do is to stylize these and sort of trace them out. And even though they're not occurring exactly the same number, okay, this is still what we would refer to as a uniform distribution, where most of the scores are showing up about equally frequently. Okay, and this is also some, sometimes called a rectangular distribution, because if you stylize the shape of it even more, then it would just be like drawing a rectangle um, on our x-axis there.